Hello grade 11s and welcome to your next section of work. You've grown up so much that I'm now going to start doing some scandalous work with you. We're going to start on the basics of evolution. Ooh, dangerous. All right, so um, I'm not going to teach you evolution itself. I'm just doing one section of it. Um, and I think to a large extent, I've done a lot of work where we have spoken about common ancestors, we've spoken about how species have developed certain characteristics over time, um, and those characteristics have led them to becoming new and different species. And even within those different groups or those phyla that we're talking about as well, there's also different individuals within each one of those as well. I mean, we know there's different types of crabs, there's different types of um, uh starfish there's a whole bunch of different types of everything so we kind of need to allude to how i got there um and it's nothing too crazy i am mainly going to focus on the idea of natural selection so i'm going to quickly talk about natural selection briefly um a really famous example was um during the um industrial revolution there was a particular kind of moth and it was called the pepper moth and it was white in color and had fine black speckles on it and it was able to survive on trees because the trees were white as well so you actually couldn't see them they were very highly camouflaged and um, to a large extent about i think it was 98 percent of their entire species was this white color and then there was a two percent of the species that was slightly darker um maybe more black like charcoal color and during the industrial revolution a lot of the trees actually became soot filled and um, there was this thick layer of like you know carbon all over them and what ended up happening was the pepper moths that were able to camouflage themselves on these very light trees now all of a sudden stuck out quite badly and they were eaten quite a lot by the birds and the two percent of the population that was slightly dark or charcoal colored they actually changed um, well they didn't change but they became um the ones that were able to reproduce because they weren't being eaten within a couple of years and i really mean i think it was about 10 years or so the population size of the darker pepper moth rose to about 95 percent whereas the white moths um dropped to about five percent of the whole population so you know the idea of natural selection is you know and that maybe is specifically because of its genetics so the genetics you know there was just a, a separate trait that allowed one part of the species to survive better now if over time that darkened pepper moth kept on changing um let's say they grew a flatter body size maybe um you know just a whole bunch of stuff kept on happening into it and you know because of its um, genetics it just kept on drifting further and further away the more that those moths started reproducing with each other eventually it would become a new species okay so that's the idea of natural selection where because of specific genetic traits we now know that um, certain species can actually change over time and that is called modification by descent all right so this is called modification of body plans but the main thing itself is called modification by descent and i'm going to go over the symmetric again with you guys but just as so you guys have a basic understanding now of what modification by descent is and so modification is the changing through descent which is the movement of genetics from one generation to the next 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 um, and this was mainly brought on by the changing environment so a lot of the time it could be because of environment um, it could be because of random genetic mutations um, there really are a whole bunch of stuff that can actually change a species over time and please don't think that this happens very quickly this really does take a substantial amount of time i mean i think the the shortest evolution that we know um has taken about five thousand years and the longest is a couple of million so um please don't think that this is something where you just kind of like watch an animal start flashing in the corner of the kruger national park and all of a sudden it becomes a new species um and you know so we're going to focus a little bit Charles Darwin because he's the badass that managed to discover all of this well not discover he actually created the theory of evolution so please remember that a theory is a group of ideas that are backed up by some facts and those facts are that it will that the facts that create the theory allows the theory to explain a whole bunch of different phenomenon all right and so the word theory doesn't mean that it's factless um, it doesn't mean someone just randomly came up with it and they were like, well, this sounds like a good idea. It was really because someone actually thought about it and like now can use this theory of evolution to explain how different species can change over time. So let's talk about good old Charles, love old Charles. 
Um, he was actually famous for barnacles, strangely enough, yeah. So he did a voyage to the Galapagos Islands on the HMS Beagle. Um, it's just a big boat, okay? I'm not going to ask you what the ship's name was, but in case you need to know it for future, it's a HMS Beagle. Um, and he published his theory of evolution in 1859, um, and this was called On the Origin uh, sorry, on the origin of species, and this book became so scandalous. I mean, you know, he was he was talking about how species could change, and you know, he started coming up with these family trees, and the church was going absolutely ballistic. And he was quite a, a, a church, or well, he was quite a religious man. And uh, because of his like teachings and his science, he actually got excommunicated um, quite badly. Also, a little bit of scandal about him. He was married to his first cousin. All right, so they had the same grandfather. How disgusting is that? But anyway, it's important to know that uh, later on, when we start talking about hybrids and interbreeding and um, breeding within the same, you know, family, how that becomes so very dangerous. Because out of his ten kids, I think two, three couldn't reproduce, four died, and I think the other three weren't exactly very robust, he put it. <laughs> you know, like, it, he, they, they just, they, they weren't really functional, like, human beings. So, he worked on these barnacles, and also it was pretty scandalous. So there was another guy that was working on um, the same idea of evolution, and it was just because Charles got, Darwin got his work in first that he became famous. Uh, there was another guy who actually finished his work first, but didn't get the book published. So, because Charles Darwin was a celebrity at the time, and he got his book in first, that's how he became the actual better person at this. There were a whole bunch of other scientists that tried to d disprove him at the time, um, but they just they just didn't get it right, um, s sadly enough. You know, like science is all about creating these theories and, you know, these understandings. So he had two main arguments, though, and these are very important for you to understand. That similar organisms are related and stem from a common ancestor. And we spoke about that quite extensively in the last two sections of work, okay? So if we all look similar... Um, it means that we share some sort of common ancestor, and even if we don't look similar, but we share similar characteristics, it also means that we came from a common ancestor. Because the environment is continually changing, variation in species develops. Natural selection arose while others died out. Only the most adapted individuals could survive in the changes in the environment, and so these well-adapted individuals are naturally selected for. So, if I'm able to survive and I'm able to mate and my genetics get moved on, and those genetics are so different to everyone else's, I could ultimately cause a change in the population itself. Um, no, I'll get into that next year. All right, Darwin proposed that modifications of basic body plans um indicate they came from a common ancestor okay we spoke about this a couple of times um and that's why this misconception that humans come from monkeys is complete rubbish we don't come from monkeys we come from apes so our closest relatives are the chimpanzees orangutans the gibbons um the the type of the, the, the ape-like structures that don't have a proper tail so we've all had this reduced tail um you don't have a tail neither does a chimpanzee nor orangutan nor gorilla um it is mainly just for the fact that they we didn't we stopped using it to a large extent we grew longer arms um the monkeys themselves however they are a close ancestor of the apes themselves but there was quite a lot of difference and change in between that so you know, we're talking about, um, what is King Julian again from uh, the Marmosets? Yes. Um, and there's another name for them. The ring-tailed lemurs. All right. So they all had tails and those tails put them in the monkey section, um, whereas we're part of the ape section. So please, if some idiot comes up to you and says, oh, we came from monkeys, just punch him in the face and be like, yeah, hundreds of thousands of millions of years ago. Okay, not millions. This <laughs> is about uh, 400,000 years ago. Alrighty, so now that you guys have a bit more ammunition in your plate, let's carry on. So, we're going to look at front limbs specifically, specifically in mammals as well, because mammals are easily accessible to us, we understand them, and we quite clearly know the lineage, because it's one of the most recently developed lineages of animals, so we know quite well. So, we're going to look at the front limbs of them, and some of this hopefully should not surprise you and some of it should be like ooh ah all right so let's look at the front limbs they look different and perform a diff uh, different structures uh, sorry uh, they look different and perform different structures but they show the same basic structure so i want you to look at your arm from your shoulder down 
you recognize that you have your um, upper arm, um, which is your humerus. You then have your forearm, which is your radius and ulna. Then you have your wrist bones called your carpals. Then you have all the bits and pieces between where your knuckles are and your wrist is. Those are called your metacarpals. And finally, you have your fingers and they are called your phalanges. OK, I don't expect you to know those words off by heart right now. We are doing the skeleton a little bit later. But I mean, we have briefly mentioned it. So just know that your body is made out of the uh, uh, upper arm, forearm, um, wrist bones, hand bones, and then fingers. Okay, And that's going to be important when you guys are able to distinguish between all these different mammals. So this is a word you really need to know, and you need to know this definition. A homologous structure, or homologous, depending on how you feel like pronouncing it for the day. So um, homologous structures are similar structures same build but different functions so what we're going to look at is how these bones that i mentioned earlier in the four well in the, the front limb um, has modified itself to be able to produce different functions okay so homologous structures provide evidence of evolution so note that it says evidence and not facts uh, because remember that this is a theory there are some facts but um, most of it is just we can see it happening multiple times and if we know that it's eventually happening we'll be able to kind of insinuate that it's a fact but we can't actually say yes for sure this is how it works so similarities can be traced back to the common ancestor um, I was actually doing some research just to you know plump up my knowledge about this before I did this and to a large extent um, whales used to walk on land uh, they have something called vestigial organs so like they have a pelvis and you think to yourself like why on earth do they need a pelvis and that's because their ancient ancestors actually used to walk on land i know it's scandalous but go and if you if you want to watch a video just let me know and i'll put it up on the bio group so birds reptiles amphibians and mammals front limbs share the same basic structure and there it is on the right hand side the humerus which is a top bone um, the ulna and radius, the carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. You need to understand this basic structure, okay? So then we have the humerus, which is the uh, first or one proximal long bone. We then have two distal bones, which just means it's further away from the center of the body. Those are the radius and the ulna. We have wrist bones, five palm bones, and finally the um, phalanges, which are the fingers and the toes. All right, so the limb alongside has five phalanges. The word for five is penta, and dactyl means digits or um, fingers for that matter. So it's a pentadactyl limb, okay? It's a limb with five fingers. Now the structural modifications take place as the function of the limb changes. So remember I briefly mentioned earlier about natural selection. So if you can remember that, if an individual ends up in a different environment where it has different genetics, it's going to change its structures because of how it's able to survive and cope and reproduce in that environment. And over time, certain structures are going to be selected for, and by selected, I mean those are the ones that only survive. And when they're selected for, that is the structure that's going to be able to um, go on into the future and eventually change the species potentially. So there are five individuals that you need to know. You just need to learn the function and adaptations of these five. OK, I do not expect you to be able to explain natural selection to me um, this year. Next year, sure. But this year, I just need you to know how these homologous structures all relate to each other and what the differences are between the function adaptation and from the original um, structure that you saw earlier. So we have the mole, that cute little thing. Its function is to dig, okay? And to dig, you need to have a shovel-like structure. So you can see its um, structure on the right-hand side over there. So its adaptations are the bones are in front, are, the front limbs are short and strong and have enough power for digging. They've also got very pointed uh, bones at the end of their fingers to actually allow for that digging to occur. Remember, they also lost their eyesight. So their humerus is extremely reduced, but thick. They all know in radius look like they're almost fused. A carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges are very short and very close to each other, which is going to create the scoop-like structure for you to actually maneuver through the entire thing. Then we have the bat. Its function is for flying. So its bones are long and thin and light, making flight possible. Phalanges are elongated, so they um, hold on when hanging upside down. And you can see from the right hand side over there, the various, the, the huge difference between the mole and the bat. 
in terms of their metacarpals and phalanges is that they are extremely long and thin and this allows um, attachment for the skin itself onto the wing or to create the wings and then when you move those you can actually push the air down which allows you to fly you also note that the radius and ulna are like very reduced and almost like one bone again and then the humerus is quite short for you to be able to bend that wing in as quickly as possible then we have the horse this thing is so weird it's so interesting so um it's for running fast you can notice that it is pushed up so its adaptations are the bones are long and strong and allow for big stride the third phalange so your middle finger the one that you pull at everyone when you hate them or you dislike them or you want to swear at them without saying it uh the third phalange is elongated and has a hoof so your equivalent of a nail is their hoof so from that particular middle phalange itself it's able to push out and the rest of the phalanges have become so reduced and small that you can barely even notice them anymore so the humerus is quite short all known radius is elongated and thick the carpals have been extremely reduced the metacarpals are extremely elongated you can quite clearly see that um, it's trying to push that leg down quite a bit and then we have that middle phalange that is extending into a hoof then we have the dolphin its function is swimming adaptations of the bones are short and strong and um, the webs between the phalanges form flippers okay so it's very much like the um, bat but what you notice is that the humerus radius and ulna are all extremely flat oh, sorry extremely thick and um, they sort of come together to almost create one bone the carpals are extremely reduced the metacarpals are slightly elongated in the phalanges and you'll notice that they're so into space that it actually creates this long flipper like structure and that is to allow for the uh, muscle attachment onto the humerus um, and ulna and radius so they can move please remember that movement is all about the attachment of muscle as well so these certain individuals all have very different bone structures which allows for different types of um, muscle attachment um, and that means that you can move different parts individually so for instance a horse does not want to move its phalanges independently okay it wants to still have movement but it doesn't want as much as humans um, <clears throat> which allows each one of our phalanges to move independently. It's the same with the dolphin. You, you don't want to move your independent phalanges, so you want to web them together so that they can create a larger surface that allows them to swim faster. Finally, we've got our little monkeys over there. They're for climbing trees. You can note their elongated arms. Their arms are almost as long as their legs, sometimes longer. Their adaptations or their bones are long, thin, and light. Something like humans, um, but humans more so started to thicken their radius and um, humerus just for bigger muscle attachment because we like to lift things um, as opposed to hanging on things so the bones are long and thin and light they have extremely long phalanges and they like to hold on firmly to branches okay so these extended phalanges really help them hold on to things and um, actually navigate their environment so that's it that's your basics to modification by descent I am going to do a tiny bit more um, basics of evolution tomorrow. We're going to start with something called biogeography and how that has led different individuals into different environments, which has allowed them to become new species based on the changing in environments. All right. Hope you have a great day, ladies.